Hello everybody, it's me, Kenneth, and I'm here with Phil, Phil Misselberger, uh, or P.T. Misselberger, and Phil is the author of three books, A Natural Awakening, or Natural Awakening, The Three Dangerous Magi, and his last book came out last year, which is uh, A Rude Awakening. And I will not uh, read out Phil's complete bio <laughs> because it's really long, and you know the number of paths that he the path that's, paths that he's explored uh, are really uh, numerous. Uh, but uh, suffice to say that he is a transpersonal therapist. He is a workshop leader, and he lives in Canada. So, Phil, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Ken. Glad to be here. So, Phil, um, you know, let's let's kind of stick with the theme of awakening this uh, this hour. And you know, I I feel like there were many there were, well, it's two approaches that you're taking with your two oh. books, natural awakening and rude awakening. And in natural awakening, you know, I guess there's a, there was a lot of clarity that you brought out in this process of, of awakening and enlightenment or seeking enlightenment or clarifying what enlightenment is and in rude awakening you in a sense uh, made sure to deal with a lot of common fallacies uh, that are out there today in this day and age about awakening and enlightenment so maybe let's just start with the very basics you know before going into it too deep um, do you want to define awakening for us well um one of the um, surest uh, models that uh, I like to use for this is uh, was Gurdjieff's um, uh, way of putting it. Uh, he had a very simple way of, de of describing uh, the idea of awakening, which is that um, uh, we're all in a type of prison, <clears throat> um, but we can't get out of the prison until we first realize we are in a prison. And so uh, the idea, of course, is that um, we humans are living only a tiny percentage of our potential capacity uh, for experiencing uh, reality and for experiencing uh, the nature of who we really are. And uh, as to what uh, is, uh, let's say, blocking us or impeding us from living that full capacity, this is something that... Uh, uh, mystics and religious thinkers and philosophers and psychologists have uh, tackled for a long time, all coming up with different views, but all basically agreeing that we're uh, not fully experiencing the anywhere near the the reality of, of what we're capable of experiencing. And uh, whether that is thought of as moving from a point A to a point B in terms of a progression, a development of wisdom, understanding, consciousness, or whether that is thought of as we already are that which we seek, but it's merely veiled or covered, uh, much like clouds covering the sun, which is already there. Um, however we think of that is secondary to the reality that uh, uh, there is a process of, of, of awakening that occurs as we look uh, deeper into our nature. The old expression, when you're in a burning building, never mind how the fire started, just get out of the building, uh, becomes important here. Because the, the analysis and the speculating and the conjecturing and the, th the philosophizing, theorizing as to how the fire started is really uh, secondary to the practicality of moving out of it. And this is where the work really gets engaged, and this is what uh, uh, separates um let's say the, the you know the, the the theoretical philosopher from the uh the mystic that is actually engaged in the process of uncovering their true nature now one can be a, i often say one can be a philosopher and a mystic at the same time there's no problem there or philosopher in the true meaning of the word lover of uh knowledge and wisdom uh, although, however, a lot of philosophies, especially modern academic philosophies, more hair-splitting uh, uh, details of theory. And uh, what we're really involved in, uh, in terms of engaging an awakening process, uh, is the practicality of it all. Um, how to get out of that burning building that we're in. Of course, what is the burning building? The burning building is the recognition uh, that we're uh, suffering uh, often unnecessarily. 
and that uh, we're not living anywhere near the uh, the capacity that, um, that we can be living. I just want to cover, uh, well, Rude Awakening's first hard truth is that it's hard. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, the you know that whole thing with that book was. Uh, I, I'm in my you know approaching my mid fifties now, and uh, I started on the spiritual path at a very young age, <clears throat> late teens, early twenties, seriously. And each decade presented certain th- phases of uh, understanding and and uh, growth that I went through. And uh, reaching around the half century mark, I, be- I became aware of the need to use uh, a little more critical thought in terms of applying it towards. Uh, the, uh, the the limitations of spirituality and um, uh, of the various approaches to spirituality, uh, of course, as well. And the first thing that became obvious to me was over the years of being involved, 30 years in various forms of uh, personal growth communities and various spiritual communities and awakening schools, that was that there's this very sharp distinction between uh, the conventional self and the ideal self that we aspire towards. Uh, and many of the early uh, humanistic psychologists became aware of this in the early 20th century. People like Maslow and Rogers and uh, Otto Rank and, and these guys were becoming aware that there was a, a, an issue of the split between the idealized self and the reality of simply what we are. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of the humanistic psychotherapies that were developed by those people and that really came into their own sort of in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, altered the approach of psychotherapy from having to uh, uh, fix or change ourselves into some uh, idea of normalcy that we should be conforming to, uh, to a different approach which was recognizing what's going on for us right now in this moment, simply in this moment. Um, and can there be a deeper more profound radical acceptance of what is occurring for us in this moment instead of always struggling with what we are and trying to match it to some ideal of what we should be and so the that's why i wrote that first hard truth that's the, you know that the whole idea of awakening is uh, uh, is much more difficult than people uh, uh, commonly think it is when they f- pick up their first book on uh, on you know on transformational work um, because in the beginning it does seem you know quite um, attractive in many ways, the idea that we simply have to study, understand, do this, do that, and there will be these uh, uh, extraordinary changes occurring within us. Um, but as anybody knows who tackles this issue, the the matter is much deeper and much more difficult. And uh, it, because of having to engage all the f- fine print of everyday living and having to, trying to integrate uh, these understandings and the and this and the and the you know the work with one's daily life, and so the main point that I was making there with that first point is that we have this regular self that we experience ourselves to be, and then this ideal that we aspire towards when we start thinking of spirituality, and uh, if we're not careful, what can easily happen is a is a split occurs between the two, an artificial split occurs between the two, in which uh, the idealistic self. Um, uh, becomes more of a fantasy in our mind that we're not actually living. Mm. And so the way we try to try to live it is we uh, start preaching spiritual principles in a very casual way to people around us. Well, I, you know, I've read this, uh, I practice this, I've studied that, um, but so what? Is it making any difference, really? You know, and uh, is is the regular self been transformed in any sort of way? Is it even possible to transform the regular self? Uh, it, all these essential questions, you know, have to be looked at. And uh, I, I recall once uh, one fairly well-known spiritual teacher who traveled around the world doing a little research here and. Uh, uh, asking questions of spiritual teachers and people who had done transformational work and wanted to know the nitty-gritty details, was anybody actually changing? And what he had discovered over time was that uh, when people were honest, when people really you know, uh, confessed and admitted to, to what sort of transformations had actually gone on in their life over a period of time, that there, were, there actually was very little change. Very few people were actually changing. Uh, people had gained information, knowledge, uh, you know, had read the books, 
had some experiences, and that's a whole other thing that you know we can talk about what an ex- what these experiences amount to. But that fundamentally there was no real essential change on the inside, and uh, so the problem, of course, with you know with spiritual experiences is that you have a what you know Maslow, for example, called peak experiences, uh, um, and then they become part of a trophy case, let's say, of experiences that we can talk about boast about, uh, uh, compare, you know, to define our identity as different from others, uh, and so on and so forth. But again, uh, they're just ornaments. They're not really amounting to anything. Yeah. Phil, no fundamental you, change. Sorry, before you go on, I want to clarify this uh, term that you're using, the idealized self. Would you say that's the same thing as a higher self? Or what most people think a higher self is? No, in in the uh, in the term that I mean it by, uh, the idealized self is a fantasy that um, uh, we aspire towards, and uh, is a part of a false part of personality. So it's a right. new persona so a that we, yeah, it's a fiction. It's a new persona that we develop. Uh, the higher self. Um, it's tricky in terms of terms, in terms of terminology, because uh, certainly many people who get involved with. Um, uh, awakening teachings uh, don't necessarily care that much for the term higher self because it, it involves something that is uh, the idea of something that is above something else. Which mm. um, above what? I mean, what are we really talking about here? If uh, if we're seeing beyond the illusion of space and time, and separation and so forth, then uh, the higher doesn't uh, is not a particularly good term. But of course, it's a metaphor. Higher self is a metaphor for uh, a, a depth of wisdom and a greater clarity. Uh, a deeper understanding of true nature, uh, our true nature, and what that is. So, uh, no, they're different. Your higher self, uh, if it means anything, if it if it is a metaphor that refers to uh, our actual conditioned condition uh, via enlightenment and awakening, then that's fine. But idealized self, as I'm using it, is a fiction that we create in our mind, and and is a is a is a, a very common problem among spiritual seekers. Mm. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to, to talk about as well with that train of the train of thought was, I guess we see a lot of um, actually what I'm seeing in the course community is this um, adherence to I am not a body, you know, and I, you know, it's all an illusion, and I guess that also is a parallel with what some people call the neo advaita community, where you know we have these teachers just coming out saying like referring to themselves in the third person, saying it's not real, so and so forth. But do you want to comment on that? Is that what you're saying here, an avoidance to uh, be the lower self or to yeah, abide it, in that ideal, idealized self? Exactly. The, um, the uh, problem with the idealized self uh, in a, from, a, from the spiritual point of view is that uh, inevitably it involves um, – uh, uh, some sort of a disassociation from physical reality and the body as well. And the body becomes seen to be this, uh, you know, this problem that is in the way and this uh, distraction, uh, which is very much like the old Gnostic views, uh, was in, in the Gnostic teachings that arose around the time of Christ. The basic idea was that uh, God didn't create this universe. The true God had nothing to do with this universe. It was created by a false God that they called Ialdabaoth, or the Demiurge, which means, uh, the term literally means the architect, the architect who built this universe. And this uh, false God is a lesser version of the true God, let's say. And uh, from that stem this whole idea that the universe was a series of dimensions working down to the physical level, uh, which were denser and denser and further removed from the true God, who had nothing to do uh, with this world. And that if you wanted to wake up and return back up the, uh, the pipeline, so to speak, to get back to source, uh, you would be confronted by these forces called archons. And the archons had, a, had an actual agenda to keep you asleep. It's very similar to what the Matrix movie was all about, if you recall. Uh, there were these agents that yeah. showed up, Agent right? Smith, and the, yeah. yeah, exactly, Agent Smith, and they were all about uh, sunglasses. Uh, they were all about sunglasses. <laughs> That's what, they were all about uh, keeping you in the dream, uh, keeping you locked into the the illusion of the virtual reality, and that, that that they ripped all that off totally from the Gnostic teachings. The the Gnostic view is that is that if you try to wake up, you're going to encounter these 
dragons and monsters on the path, so to speak, or or agents and sunglasses that are uh, going to be against you you waking up. Now, what happened with that whole model? Of course, they threw Christ into the mix, and they said Christ was the redeemer, and He will come down and He will uh, activate the spark of light that is inherent within you, and then you can come back up to uh, to source. But with the whole model. Um, suffered from a certain problem, which is that uh, because the idea was that the original God, the true God, had nothing to do with this material universe, the material, un material universe was thought to be a negative. And as time went on, the teachings became sort of corrupted, as they tend to do over time. And there entered this view in Gnosticism that the material universe was not just negative, it was actually evil. And so the body was actually evil. And uh, <clears throat> the Course in Miracles um, has some Gnostic overtones to it. As we all know, uh, it has some, uh, you know, very powerful teaching in many ways. But the what one has to be aware of in terms of one's approach to it is the is that Gnostic overtone uh, that suggests that the body is not just a, a, an illusion, but that the body is a negative. Now, the course maintains that the body is neutral, uh, which means essentially it's saying that it's an illusion um, to be overcome to be seen through, what have you. But it's very easy for someone who has any sort of psychological blocks in terms of negative self-image, uh, in terms of uh, uh, repressed sexuality, in terms of uh, guilt uh, associated with one's sexuality and so forth, to uh, take that and fuse it to the teachings of the Course, even though the Course is saying explicitly um, that the body is neutral, but to fuse their own psychological blocks to the teachings of the Course and, and unknowingly use the teachings of the Course as a way to escape the physical dimension. I don't have to go there, thank God, I've been relieved of the whole thing. Uh, I don't have to examine my, 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 my guilt around my sexuality, I don't have to examine my, my resistance to being a responsible being in the physical universe, paying my bills and uh, <clears throat> living responsibly and so forth. Um, I can just get out of this whole thing because the Course says, after all, all we have to do is, is uh, do our forgiveness work right? and take back our projections and we can escape this world. And that's all very well, but uh, it very easily becomes uh, part of that whole idealized self I was talking about. Um, the idealized self, the one who is ascending back to some source uh, that involves escaping all the lessons and conditions of this physical world. And um, when you get into the whole thing, uh, for example, if I can just uh, you know go here for a minute, the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve and the serpent, very interesting, that whole story. Uh, now, the Gnostic teaching is that the serpent was not an evil force, but the serpent was actually a liberator or a teacher that has come to um, provide Adam and Eve with the, the, you know, the, the fruit of knowledge, the tree of knowledge, so that they can uh, uh, develop an ego and differentiate from their parent, which is father, uh, God, and uh, develop some sense of individuality, which can then lead to their own higher development and so forth. And there's certainly a, a lot of validity to that, um, but it also overlooks uh, certain factors that are uh, inherent in that teaching, which is that uh, uh, evil, let's say, is a very real force throughout uh, uh, you know, human history in terms of uh, actions demonstrable actions. There's no question that there are, you know, there are people that have done evil things and that continue to do evil things. And uh, to dismiss all that and say, it's well, evil is simply an illusion created by fear and belief in this illusion, illusory physical universe may be true on a theoretical level, but it doesn't mean a whole lot in terms of uh, 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 the, demonstra the, the demonstrable and the practical, because um, uh, as Emerson once said, who you are speaks so loudly, I can't hear what you say. So, meaning that um, uh, we, all the theories in the world and all the philosophies in the world will not uh, uh, alter the, the reality of what our being is transmitting moment by moment. So, there is a, there is a reality to this physical world is what I'm saying. And um, uh, if we don't address it, then it too easily becomes something that we're simply repress, repressing or, or trying to bypass. And the Gnostic teachings that the, you know, that the serpent was a liberator um, that the uh, the physical world is a negative and so forth uh, have their merits for sure, but they also have some deficiencies in them. You know, in that um, they uh, they tend to overlook some of the realities uh, uh, that are 
very obviously part of our existence, and that is how to negotiate reality in a physical world and face up to the face up to the uh, the things that are demonstrably real around us. Hmm. Now, Phil, another theme that I wanted to talk about with you is this um, uh, fluffy ideas of the new age, which arguably does lend itself to to some uh, aspects of the course community in terms of not really embracing the uh, how should I say the almost like the clinical approach of of Zen in Advaita when it comes to awakening. Do you want to just talk about well, just let's talk about the New Age and some of the fallacies in the New Age movement. Well, uh, New Age. Um teachings really began in the uh, late 19th century. The 18, in 1894, there was a magazine in, uh, in uh, England run by A.R. Oraj, who later became a student of Gurdjieff. It was called the New Age. A lot of people don't realize this. The 1910s, 1920s, there was uh, a huge movement towards um, uh, a huge movement towards um, uh, syncretizing spiritual teachings, and at the end of the 19th century, the, the fin de siècle, it was called the end of the century. That was uh, an interesting period because of the science that was arising in the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, especially Darwinian evolution and that whole thing. Uh, there was a revolt that occurred in the so-called underground. Uh, in which mystical teachings sought to bring back the importance of the human being because they thought the human had been decentralized by Darwin. Uh, Copernicus had already done that uh, 200 years prior to that and Galileo by showing that the Earth is not the center of the universe. And Darwin then showed there's nothing terribly special about the human being. So the human being was being decentralized and pushed aside and, and uh, there was something of a desire amongst the romantics and later the mystics and the occultists to return to um, the, you know Shakespeare's man is the measure of all things. We are the center of things and to bring some of that back. And so in all of that, there was a desire to start unifying spiritual teachings and bringing them all together uh, to reassert the primacy of man, let's say. And then that, you know, that part receded during the war years, especially the second year of war years, and then it came back again. Uh, you know, in the 1960s and 70s, and especially in the 1980s, and the, the you know, the, the the idea behind it all was legitimate and sincere, which was to uh, take the best of all different spiritual teachings, and uh, and, and cross-reference them in a in a way that was useful and helpful. But of course, the limitation of it all was it resulted in diluting things and making things very superficial, and uh, you know, making making people. Um, Focus on shallower elements of spirituality that uh, you know that really had um, very little to do with uh, the depths of the awakening process. And the and the way I simplify this whole thing in terms of understanding what we're talking about here is um, in a lot of the new age approaches, the movement has always been to encourage people to move towards the light, let's say, and towards ease and to avoid the dark and to avoid effort. Yeah. And uh, whereas when you look at all the uh, processes of transformation that is recorded by all the le you know great legitimate mystics throughout history, is they always talk about this period, this phase you go through of encountering the darkness, uh, Christ out in the desert facing Satan, uh, Buddha under the Bodhi tree facing Mara, and of course you know the great uh, poet Dante who talks about his journey through uh, you know through the realms and he begins Virgil takes him to hell first he goes to hell and then purgatory and then paradise and that's a metaphor for the whole process of awakening you really you face hell first because uh, you have to face into the 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 reality of what you think of yourself and how just how intensely negative you know that can be in terms of uh, negative self-image and self-loathing which is a part of most people's character structure at some level uh, and so the, 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 you know, the process of, of depth psychology in, in the true sense of the word and uh, the awakening process is one of facing into the darkness first and then uh, it, much like the shaman goes out in the desert and has to wrestle with the demon uh, first in order to um, prior to uh, uh, you know, experiencing the more light realms let's see of uh, of higher nature, and the New Age teachings tended to avoid that to a large degree. There was more of an emphasis on sort of rushing headlong into the, into the light, 
And so uh, I, I had noticed this over the years because I was, you know, involved in various forms of this over the years. And uh, there was always, um, you know, the the very prevalent sense that uh, uh, the work was superficial and uh, there was a fear of encountering um, the darker parts of the psyche. So, uh, you know, and much of this had to do with... Um, uh, say a feminization of the whole path as well, which was uh, understandable because the human uh, human civilization has been locked into a very masculine, um, patriarchal, uh, religious, you know, philosophies for a long time, and so in the movement of the 1960s human potential through Maslow, Rogers, and others, there was uh, the the emphasis was shifted from uh, action to feelings. So the feminine angle was emphasized more, and that was emphasized even more in the 1980s, 1990s, New Age movement. Uh, the the whole thing became feminized, and so you, you start to experience the neurotic aspect of the feminine, which is overemphasis of feelings and avoidance of action. Hmm. Uh, and the neurotic aspect of the masculine is reverse. It's overemphasis on actions and avoidance of feelings. So the alchemy of the whole process, if you will, is to achieve some kind of a balance between these two. Um, but we're, we're a long way from getting there. We're actually in, in a phase right now in which the, the feminization is, is, uh, of the whole thing, let's say, is dominating. And the, uh, the, you know, the masculine elements have been sort of uh, uh, cast out for the time being and are something of a taboo, much like the reverse was true, say, 100 years ago. The, the feminine approach was more of a taboo then. Uh, this is with regards to the spiritual community. Yes, the, the, the whole, uh, all the transformational work. Yes, exactly. And so, uh, the, 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 you know, the, these are all, uh, there's nothing really wrong with any of us. These are all parts of us finding our way through this whole thing. Um, but the, the weaker parts of the New Age teachings are what I call the fluffy, feel-good spirituality is based on this idea that uh, if we can just get rid of anxiety, then, you know, then everything's okay and our awakening is proceeding as it, as it should be. And so what happens is that the, the, the state of no anxiety gets confused with the awakening process, what I call the proverbial group hug. And, uh, uh, you know, the proverbial group hug is, uh, is reassuring and uh, lowers anxiety. But what happens when you leave the group and off, or off on your own again, you discover... Uh, that uh, this is really sort of like a drug that's going to wear off over time, yeah. um, because it's 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 based on it's a band-aid sort of thing, which is based on the idea that if we can f form community, you know, and uh, you know, get together and do work with each other, um, we will, in essence, lower our, our our anxiety. Why? Because we're replacing our dysfunctional family with a new family that mm -hmm. appears to have everything that our dysfunctional family did not have. Uh, but in fact, all we're really involved in is uh, is lowering anxiety. Mm -hmm. Not that there's anything wrong with having, uh, you know, with being free of anxiety. Obviously, it's a desirable state, but uh, it's not. It's really not what uh, the awakening process is about because uh, it tends to be a temporary thing. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that that was what I was differentiating in the book was um, uh, between uh, feel good spirituality and uh, and deep awakening. Um, one is based on the, the you know, feel-good spirituality is based on lowering anxiety, and uh, deep awakening is faced is based on uh, tackling all the blocks that are in the way of us being a truly responsible being in this universe. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's like going for surgery versus uh, you know stitching up a wound, and you know not allowing the the wound to actually heal. Yeah, that's a good analogy. That's a, that's a that's a very good analogy. The band-aid effect, right? And uh, I, I was emphasizing, you know, the the balance between the masculine and the feminine because the masculine, uh, it, you know, in its dysfunctional way, will tend to, uh, let's say, uh, to really generalize here to avoid the band-aid altogether, you know, and 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 want to go straight for the surgery without necessarily using any uh, anesthetic. Um, whereas the feminine might want to avoid the surgery altogether and just put a band-aid on it. Neither one works. You know, one is brutal, the other one avoids things. And so what we're trying to do is go beyond brutality and av beyond avoidance of issues mm -hmm. and find that, that, uh, that medium, 
Yeah, that that uh, integrates both aspects, balance. Do you want to talk a little bit about spiritual community? Because obviously, I, I know you've been involved in, uh, you know, obviously you were, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, a sannyasin of, of Osho? Uh, yeah. Oh, sannyas? Oh, I don't know what the name is, sorry. Sanya, sannyasin, yeah. yeah. Sannyasin. Do you want to talk about spiritual community? And Okay, I mean, most importantly, what, uh, how should we approach spiritual community? Well, the, the Buddha once said, in order to wake up, you need Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Uh, Buddha means, in that context, a teacher, a teaching, teach, sorry, a teacher, um, somebody who represents the Buddha mind, let's say. Uh, a a sang, uh, Dharma is a system of teaching, right, like a book or, or a system you're following uh, in, the, in this context. And, then, and Sangha is the fellowship. And the fellowship um, is, is important because uh, while solitary practice has its place, uh, retreats and so forth, and spending time at learning to be comfortable with yourself on your own is certainly, obviously, extremely important. Uh, from time to time, you need to compare notes and to engage the reality of the physical universe, which is that we're in a body with senses and uh, we have a social conditioning um, you know, we're much like wolves. You know, we we we've sought they're solitary wolves, and we're also pack animals at the same time. And the idea with the birds of a similar feather, sort of thing, is uh, spiritual community is um, associating uh, with those who are sincere in their desire to awaken, to challenge anything that's in the way of awakening. And uh, this has traditionally throughout history always been very important. But of course, it easily becomes corrupted. Uh, becomes corrupted if the uh, you know if um, we become fundamentalists in the sense of of parroting a doctrine. Uh, when when monks you know when people become monks or nuns and live in monasteries, uh, it often wasn't their own intention for awakening that had them put there. It was often they were there because that was just that fit with the social structure of their life as it was at the time, or, or certainly the case of Tibetan monks, many of them were just shipped off to the monastery because that's what you did. Your first son went to the monastery. Um, uh, it, it, so was this person who lived as a monk a sincere seeker? In many cases, they weren't, just because they were wearing a robe and, uh, you know, shaved their head or, uh, you know, had committed themselves to uh, to living in a you know a monastery or an ashram or what have you didn't really necessarily apply anything about the the level the intensity or the sincerity of their uh, intention for for awakening and so um, <clears throat> what this amounts to and has often amounted to it throughout history is that the spiritual song or the community becomes just a substitute uh, family or becomes a way to hide out from the world mm -hmm. to avoid the issues of living in the world um, what Gurdjieff called the fourth way, the way of the spiritual householder, uh, being in the world and, um, and not of it, so to speak, but still being in the world. Uh, the spiritual community can become a way to hide from that part, from, be from being in the world, facing up to the responsibilities of, of actually being in this world. Um, However, the spiritual community is also, in my experience, is that it's also uh, important, I would even say essential, because the problem with too much solitary seeking <clears throat> is that you are not conscious of your own blind spots. You can't see them. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> what good is, you know, what good is uh, exploring wisdom, exploring uh, depth psychology, um, uh, profound meditation, and so forth, if you can't, if you can never see your own blind spots? Because mm -hmm. it means there's parts of your own nature. Uh, in the way of deeper awakening that you're never going to be uh, able to see. And so the value of community is that, in theory, community functions as a grouping of mirrors around you that reflect back to you aspects of yourself that you otherwise couldn't see. And uh, this is a very similar process to guru yoga in its highest definition of that, uh, that uh, term, which the Tibetans developed to a very high level, which is this idea that the teacher always reflects back your highest potential. So they become a mirror in which you you can therefore notice when you're getting off, uh, you know, off focus, so to speak. Now, eventually, you have to see the teacher is nothing. The mirror is thrown out, the teacher is thrown out, and you recognize uh, that you have to, you know, uh, uh, that you have to turn within to your own wisdom and develop that. Um, but community serves as an important stepping stone 
uh, for seeing psychological blocks because people, when you live in community with people, they will piss you off, they will annoy you in all sorts of ways, they will frustrate you, they will disappoint you. And many times, most times, when that's happening, it's because of a projection. There's something in us that we're not fully owning or taking responsibility for that they are reflecting back to us. And uh, much like all close relations in life do. Now, in theory, in spiritual community, there is in place the technology to work through those projections and blocks with the others, provided they are, you know, willing and committed to, you know, to do this. Um, you know, it doesn't always work that way. Once uh, I it ran several communities long ago, and I once had a, a you know a community of about forty people in which we were all doing a lot of depth work with each other. And one person came to me once and said, "I will heal." I will break through with everyone in this community, but not that one person over there. And, uh, <laughs> and of course, it doesn't work that way. And so, you know, that person ended up leaving. Uh, because this is exactly a, a great metaphor for what happens in the whole process of awakening, right? We want to pick and choose our projections, which ones we can keep, <clears throat> which persons we're going to hang, hang out with and associate with. Uh, Gurdjieff and his school, uh, everyone there at that time had to pay him to be there. Um which was kind of revolutionary at that time. He was charging money for people to, you know, to be in his school, which I actually thought was very good because it, it, um, he used to say that unless you pay for something, you don't value it. And <clears throat> I think there was a lot of truth in that. You have to pay through commitment or sacrifice in some way in the old days, give something up. Uh, and in more current times, there's not so much to give up anymore. So people, what they give up is often some money. Anyway, uh, in this story, people were paying him to be there, but there was, one man in his community, a Russian named, uh, I think Rakhmilievich was his name, who was notorious for being a button pusher. Uh, nobody could stand the guy wherever he went. He just triggered people left and right. And Gurdjieff paid him to be there because he was so valuable. Uh, he said, we, we need this guy. He was uh, he was the joker, you know, that uh, Henry VIII's fool, so to speak, that would uh, say things that nobody else would say and, uh, and, and trigger the crap out of people. And That's so... Great. Of course, everyone hated him, but at the same time, he was the most valuable uh, part of the whole community because he made everyone aware of their stuff. By being, yeah, you know, a shit would, stirrer, uh, huh? That's right, exactly. Now, I actually wanted to come back to a point that you made earlier about Guru Yoga. And, you know, just, just reading through your book, you're, uh, it seems to me you're a proponent of this the, the guru-disciple uh, relationship. Do you want to tell us about this guru disciple relationship because you know obviously in the course community that's that's kind of not really looked upon as a as a good thing like it's kind of like oh you got to rely on your own internal teacher and so on and so forth tell us about the guru disciple relationship well it's um it's a tricky area because uh on the one hand in theory in theory um and here again you know we're gonna have to get into the whole thing but contrasting theory with practice right idealized self with reality, practical self, let's say. In theory, uh, nobody needs a guru uh, because uh, for a lot of good reasons, you know, we can, you know, we can adopt that position. Certainly many gurus throughout uh, history have and continue to, uh, you know, make serious mistakes, have character defilements and deficiencies, and those mistakes have repercussions with the people, you know, with the people around them, uh, from subtle levels to all sorts of serious, spectacular, uh, you know, gross abuses of power, of course. There, there, there's no secret there. Um, and also, more to the point, uh, our, our consciousness is in itself the truth anyway. So what do we need another person to tell us, you know, that we're already conscious, you know, I, I'm conscious and I'm here to tell you that you're conscious. And, uh, you know, well, that's very nice. So I already know I am conscious. So thank you very much. But, but it's not so simple because what does it mean to get out of a prison? Um, and is it possible to get out of prison on our own? And uh, I'm not entirely you know, convinced that it is. Uh, much like when we go to school, uh, you know, it would be nice if we didn't need teachers to learn math and algebra and uh, geography and languages and so forth. <laughs> or if we, when we get our driver's license, it would be nice if we could simply sit in a car and start automatically driving by activating the innate driver from within. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it, it actually, as we know in life, it doesn't work that way to learn something. Traditionally, we have mentors and, and people that show us something. And so uh, I do believe in a teacher-student relationship on the spiritual path. However, with a lot of caveats and uh, 
you know, and so forth, which is you know, foremost of which is that, um, uh, uh, you know, we have to understand that in going into the process, there's a very good chance we're going to be disappointed at some point or disillusioned at some point. By uh, the guru. By the guru and by other gurus and by those that are around the guru and, uh, you know, and and so on and so forth. And so there, uh, uh, we have to understand that in, in doing this, um, we're almost certainly going to have to going to have to experience disappointment at some at some point. Just when one goes to college or university and finds out that uh, one doesn't really like all of one's professors, or that they're not really what one you know one lives up to. I remember having a professor in university long ago that I thought he was great in the class and everything, and then somebody told me afterwards the guy was a, a you know was a, a notorious egotist and a drunk, and uh, he was terrible. If you ever met him at a social event, and <laughs> and uh, you know. It, it, these kind of things and so then it was sort of like well you know so what I'm still learning things from the guy and uh, yeah. I, I think there's too much of a big deal put on the whole thing about oh you shouldn't have a guru mm -hmm. and they're all corrupt and uh, you know and so so on and so forth and, and uh, just uh, you know spend your life um, well I mean uh, it's a very western idea isn't it like I'm my own man I'm very independent you know independent thinking well, exactly. Uh, yeah, you, I mean, you nailed it there. I mean, the the we're, our cultural roots are the Greco-Roman roots, and in, and the ancient Greek and Roman legends were all about gods fighting against the odds, as I say, and uh, uh, they were you know they were challenging something. Prometheus, you know, the great you know the great figure Prometheus, uh, uh, the archetype of the Western magician, in a sense, uh, the esoteric path, which is that. Um, he stole fire from Zeus, right? And, and Zeus was keeping fire from humanity, and Prometheus steals it and g gives it to humanity. For that, Zeus is really pissed off with him and punishes him and ties him to a rock and has a vulture come and eat his liver and all kinds of <laughs> grotesque things. Yeah, those Greeks were pretty wild. Lovely. Uh, but it, it's the it's the it's the myth of fighting against gods, and so the Western psyche is based on individualism. Mm. And uh, the American psyche, even more so, because the the United States, uh, uh, you know, uh, realized its national identity by breaking away from Britain in a violent conflict. You know, we Canadians are a lot more laid back because part of our root, cultural root, was that um, we negotiated our way <laughs> to uh, to you know to having a uh, in, an independent nation. We never fought with our with the Brits. We just negotiated, yeah. whereas the Americans fought. So the, in, in the United States, there's a very strong ideal towards independence and individualism, which is not, of course, the reality. It's just an ideal. So again, the, the difference between the ideal and the reality. Uh, nobody, uh, very few people live that. I mean, the United States is a good example, as good example as any nation of uh, of uh, slavery to an economic system. Where you know, tiny percentage of people own and control everything else. Everyone else is just functioning to feed the machine. So they're no different from, you know, the rest of the world in that regard. But there is, nevertheless, there's this ideal as of the individual. And so, yes, it clashes with the Eastern uh, approach, you know, the Eastern model of the guru-disciple uh, relationship because it seems like giving away power and it seems like, uh, you know, being controlled by someone else and, you know, and so on, so on and so forth. But in in the meantime, a lot of things can be missed, a lot of opportunities missed that otherwise could be, uh, you know, gained uh, by associating, you know, you know, with with teachers. And yeah. who cares if they're not perfect or not? It's not. It's not the point. The point is, what can I learn from this person? Yeah. Do you want Granted, there. You know, I'll just add briefly. There are uh, obviously a ton of risks that go with it. You know, I wouldn't deny that for a moment. I mean, you can get, you can become attached, you know, to a teacher, and then the whole mechanism of attachment gets activated, and you have to face that whole thing. But I'm not entirely sure that there's any point in avoiding that because you're going to get attached to others in your life anyway. Um, friends, lovers, family attachments are occurring all the time. So attachment to a teacher is just a different flavor of attachment, but you still got to encounter the whole attachment process sooner or later. Jim, back to your attach back to your attachment back to the analogy of uh being in a school some people are going to say that okay my higher self or the holy spirit is my teacher what would you say to that well again it is true but the <clears throat> the practicality of it is how you know how easily can you realize that um in many traditions, the uh, you know the, the Holy Spirit, a higher self, the Holy Guardian Angel. There are a lot of different names for it. Uh, is 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 
known to be realized only through a tremendous effort on the part of the seeker. Uh, but that seeker, somewhere along the line, usually needs some sort of an inspiration or a you know role model, let's say. But inspiration is a better word for it. Maybe you know with Jesus, maybe that was John the Baptist. You know who knows? Uh, the Buddha had his own uh, you know. It, people that inspire, sort of inspired him or, or certainly uh, provoked him to continue on his path. And, you know, whether it was a dead body or a leper or a cripple or whether it was the original yogis that taught him in the forest that he eventually surpassed, uh, there was still somebody there who was saying, some indication of someone who was saying, let's go, from, you know, from point A to, to point B. So the idea is that uh, the journey from the ego self to the awakened self is fraught with all sorts of perils, but what we usually need is some sort of an inspiration to get going in the first place. You may remember the uh, the myth of Percival, the Holy Grail. Uh, he is living in the forest with his mother, and along comes one day three shining knights, and he's fascinated. He comes out and sees these three shining knights. He says, what are you doing? Where are you going? Well, they, they tell him they're on the search for the Holy Grail. And he becomes enraptured with this idea of a Holy Grail, and he then tells his mother, I'm going to join the knights in a search for the Holy Grail. Well, of course, his mother doesn't want him to leave. That is a whole other element of the psychology of the seeker having to break away from the mother or what the metaphor for the mother actually means because uh, the mother never wants you to leave the mother always wants you to stay yeah it's codependent stay home stay home stay codependent stay home but what it really means is perpetuate mediocrity continue to perpetuate the world as it has always been mm. and uh, to, to break away from um, the conventional we have to gather courage to follow the, the shining knights to where they're going. So that's the inspiration. You see, he need, Percival, in the myth, he becomes the one who actually finds the Holy Grail because he had the purity of heart to do so uh, and sincerity of intention as a seeker. But he had to be inspired by something. And what he was inspired by were the three shining knights. So those three shining knights are a metaphor for um, guides or teachers that we meet along the way. And their purpose is to inspire us. We may spend one day with them. We may spend ten years with them. Uh, the the main thing is to is to recognize that there are, are these little guiding lights that will inspire us along the way. I remember, you know, um, a teaching I had in a, in a truck stop somewhere in in a desert in Oregon, uh, 25, 30 years ago. I'm sitting in a cafeteria. A guy comes and sits opposite me with dark shades on. Of course, maybe he was an agent. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but and, and he and we somehow shared a breakfast together. And he said one thing to me, and it's sort of always you know one of the things that lodged in me. Before he, he went off, and I never saw him again. He said, he said the secret to life. He said, is stay high by your standards, not by anybody else's standards. And here's see the paradox inherent in that anecdote because. He's saying the secret to life is to stay high by your standards, not by anyone else's. So in, es in essence, what he's saying is you don't need any teachers, the mm -hmm. teachers within you. Mm -hmm. But he himself was a teacher for me in that moment. <laughs> so there you go. There's the paradox. He's saying you don't need any teachers, but he himself is embodying the teacher in that moment. You know, so he he did he was an inspiration for me. This you know this dude in a truck stop with his shades on who said, "Stay high by your standards." Would you say that's that's uh, rather reminiscent of Alistair Crowley? Like, do what you will. What it, that is the whole of the law kind of thing. Do, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Yeah, I mean that he was uh, teaching a very Taoist thing there. He was saying that your uh, your true self is the most natural thing in the world, um, and to do it. To follow the uh, to follow your true self, do what thou wilt shall you know it, it, that all that matters is to follow your true self. In other words, yeah. um, shall be the whole of the law. It's, it means that uh, uh, the only law in the universe is to follow your true self. Uh, however, he was also you know astute enough to recognize that. It's nice to say it. It's another thing to entirely walk the path and do it. And, uh, you know, he himself went out in the desert once with um, uh, a friend of his, uh, Victor Newberg, and they were doing these rituals in the desert. And uh, part of the ritual was to employ psychological and magical spiritual techniques to unearth the higher self or the holy guardian angel. And, uh, of course, what happened was instead he encountered this demon, which he called uh, uh, Koranzon. And uh, that's the same thing that Christ talks about meeting in the desert, the same thing that Buddha talks about in his awakening process under the banyan tree when Mara shows up and tries to tempt him in so many different ways. Uh, whenever we make a very powerful bid to, to awaken, 
uh, the part of our psyche that is opposed to that whole process, all of the conditioning, yeah. uh, the, you know, the so-called, um, uh, con- you know, mediocre conventional force that wants to pull you back and keep you at home, so to speak, like Percival in the, in the force there will come up, will be activated and will say, no, you don't have a right to do this. And that's how you get tested because you have to push through that. Um, you know, the Buddha's thing with Mara is always a great story because Mara uh, did all this, uh, all these temptations on him to try to, to pull him off his, uh, his intention to awaken. And then finally, at the end, Mara tried one last trick, and which was that Mara said, uh, uh, said, what right do you have, with all the people suffering in this universe, what right do you have to be so, uh, <coughs> so selfish? is to be concerned with the only your own enlightenment in the face of all the suffering in the universe. So in other words, he tried to lay the ultimate guilt trip on him. And, mm. uh, and in, the, in the legend, the Buddha reaches down and touches the earth with one hand and calls upon the earth to bear witness to his, uh, his, his intention to awaken. And then with that, Mara is defeated and disappears. Of course, Mara is nothing. Mara, Mara is just the shadow of his own psyche that uh, is in, in resistance to the awakening process um, f- for whatever angle you want to see to that, I am not worthy of awakening or uh, I will be um, breaking free of the system uh, that the agents need to keep us in uh, because I'll be waking up from the illusion and finding out this whole thing is a virtual reality, so to speak, that there's a much greater reality beyond it, getting out of Plato's cave. It all amounts to the same thing. And, and you, made, uh, you made the same analogy with Jesus, with uh, Pontius Pilate, did you? Uh, yeah, exactly. Very similar. Um, you know, uh, uh, well, Satan in the desert. You, you said Pontius Pilate, right? Yeah, I mean, like, he, uh, Pontius Pilate was asking Jesus, uh, um, yeah. what is what the is, truth? Yes. And Jesus didn't say anything. I thought that was yeah. a great analogy. I mean, a great parallel between the story of Buddha and Mara. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, yeah, there's a good similarity there too. Uh, Pilate, in a sense, represents more of the, the um, worldly, let's say, social structure that will oppose awakening, whereas yeah. Satan in the desert is more of the the spiritual, uh, you know, oppositional uh, force. But the, these things are not uh, to be regarded as uh, uh, enemies. You know, rather they are testers that sharpen the sword. Um, because how do you know how sincere your desire is to awaken if you aren't tested? By it, right, mm. and, uh, and, and it's in the very contrast of things. How do we enjoy warmth by knowing cold? How do we experience uh, compassion by knowing suffering? How do we experience the the brilliance and profundities and joys of awakening uh, by recognizing the part of us that is afraid of it, mm. that is not signed up for the process, and that will show up in the form of the monsters and demons that come into our life and appear to be, uh, you know opposed to our awakening, but what we have to do is recognize that these monsters and demons are not ultimately out there. They're parts of our own psyche. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. Well, on that note, Phil, I mean, we're coming to coming up to an hour. I mean, I would love to, for this discussion, go on. Are you okay to go on, or do you want to wrap it up? Um, well, maybe just a little bit longer. Yeah, is that yeah. okay? I love, to, I love to talk about the... Well, I love that you made case studies of enlightenment in Rude Awakening. And, uh, you know, I'm just going to quickly read out a list of seven which you chose. Socrates, yeah. Jesus, Miller Raper, Hakwin, I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrongly. Yeah, Ram, Ramana Maharshi, Nisargadatta Maharaj, and the last one, Yeko Iwasaki. Iwasaki. Do you want to... And I really appreciated that because it kind of is a... Well, I, I really think Rude Awakening is, is like the modern guide to enlightenment. It's it's updated, it's 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 diverse and it's clear, you know, and it's written from your experiences, not written in, in an academic way, but at the same time surveys a large breadth of uh, traditions. Um, yeah, I, I just really appreciate that approach that you're taking uh, with with, you know, looking at people who have gone through the path, you know, what was that path like and in a yeah. way learning from the lessons that they went through um, now I just want to zoom in and focus on on Iwasaki and you were talking yeah. about the, the bull right and, and 10 stages with the bull and maybe that's I think that's very very useful actually you know that's a great 
kind of in a way a sum, summation or a kind of a framework to talk about what the awakening process is like. Do you want to just share with us what the 10 stages are? Well, you know, the the whole thing around uh, uh, the awakening process and the 10 stages is um, uh, seeing how the bowl represents, uh, you know, that part of our mind that um, uh, is initially seems to be the uh, life force that is going to take us towards awakening, uh, but that ultimately... Um, is understood to be something we have to discard, and uh, you know the in, in those early stages of you know the man seeing the bull from a distance, and then he sees the footprints right, and then he uh, gets close to the bull and he touches the bull, <clears throat> and then he rides the bull, and the bull is a this wild force of energy, and then he has to tame the bull, and then eventually he lets go of the bull. And then as he lets go of the bull, he has this moment of solitariness where he's totally alone. And uh, he has this profound realization, which then causes him to retreat to a, a cave in the metaphor, uh, which is the ninth stage, if I, if I remember right. And then, and then ultimately he has to leave the cave and go back into the marketplace. And in some of the uh, parables, he goes back into the marketplace with a, uh, a bottle of wine. And in others, they actually excised that. It was funny because they apparently, you know, some of the, their moral radical. condition. Yeah, some of their moral condition got activated. But initially, it was a gourd uh, for wine that he was taking into the uh, marketplace. Uh, but all those stages from the, um, you know, the, the the glimpsing the bull at a at a distance occurs when we decide that uh, we have this profound uh, realization. Uh, much like Percival in the forest when the three shining knights show up. It's very similar to that. The three shining knights you could think of as the bull in some ways. Uh, it's that initial uh, mysterious inspiration or thought that enters our mind early in the journey where we realize that uh, we haven't been told the whole truth here. And again, to use the analogy of the Matrix in the movie, it's like the scene where uh, Neo is walking up the staircase and the cat walks by, and then a second later the same cat walks mm -hmm. by again. And he suddenly realized, whoa, whoa, there's a glitch in the program here. You know, that's very much what it's like when we realize there's a glitch in our program. There's something faulty in, uh, in our understanding of reality. And moreover, the conventional way of, a, of proceeding in life is not necessarily going to give it to us. Uh, you know, that might be proceeding through academic studies or what have you or through a certain line of work or achieving status in the world that is not gonna, it's not going to do it for us. There's something else we're seeing here. That that bull on the horizon is something that's outside of the whole model altogether that we've been presented, and so we start, you know, pursuing the bull. And um, there's two two levels to the parable because one, it represents the the inner movement towards awakening, and it's also a literal parable that describes the meditation process when we sit down and try to watch our own mind. And um, so we you know we pro we see the footprints on the ground, which is. Uh, symbolic of an intellectual, intellectual conviction that this whole thing is real and there's something to it. Others have experienced it. Other, there are others who walk the path of transformation. It's not something I was necessarily taught about in academia. Maybe I ha have been, but it's really just by note takers that haven't been doing any work on themselves themselves. And so there's a reality to this whole thing. And we start following the footprints. We see the you know the bull and touch it. And touching it is the moment where we have been s touched by something, so to speak that activates something in us that um, increases our level of enthusiasm. The original level, the original definition of the word enthusiasm, the Latin meaning of it, enthuse, was to be filled with God, filled with the joy of God. That's what it meant. So mm. enthusiasm is an important f factor in life. Uh, the closest correlate for enthusiasm is passion. Uh, it's necessary to have passion for truth or to be enthusiastic about the, the whole process. And the bull, with its tremendous energy, represents that enthusiasm. And so we pursue the bull, and we eventually get a hold of it, and we, we jump on top of it and ride it. And, of course, once we're on it, then we see how wild the ride is. When we start to encounter the, the power of our own consciousness and energy and the, the energy of life and the, uh, the, the challenges that the mind throws up in, in resistance to the whole path, then we start to see just how, how uh, it's more than what we bargained for. And... Uh, but eventually, if we hang in there, the bull is tamed and becomes uh, an ally of ours. At that point, all of our the power of our psyche starts working for us rather than against us. 
And that's a significant breakthrough. And that represents in meditation that point when you sit and try to watch your mind and it just seems to get worse and worse. The monkey mind gets more and more activated. The more you try to watch it, the more activated it gets. Yep. That's the bull getting out of control. And eventually if you hang in there, everything starts to settle. And the because the, your uh, attention is shifting from identification with the story around you, the thoughts, the necklace of Shakti, as it's called in Hinduism, uh, it's being transferred back into Shiva, which is the silent witness on the inside who's watching everything. And that's what, that's the moment where we're starting to disidentify with the whole drama and dance around us. And uh, at, at that moment, um, the bull is then tamed, and then eventually we realize we don't need the bull anymore, so we let it go. And uh, that letting go is uh, is symbolic of... Um, of us understanding that our true nature is not actually separate from everything around us. So we don't have to wrestle so much with the universe. It's all, there's a seamlessness we start to realize between what I am and what is around me. Uh, and in that seamlessness, the bull is let go of, and then uh, there is a, a recognition of the intrinsic emptiness of the self and uh, of its non-separation with the totality of existence. And when that recognition is fully realized in its profundity, we can then leave the cave of our solitary journey and go back into the marketplace because what's the difference? The marketplace is no difference from the cave. Um, but in going back into the marketplace, we're now sharing what we've learned with others. So this is then the path of the bodhisattva. The arhat was the one who stays in the cave and says, I'm getting out of this samsara dimension, but I don't really care about others so much, I just want out myself. The bodhisattva takes it one step further and goes back into the marketplace with his bottle of wine because he's not afraid to drink and have a good time with others, much like Jesus drinking, you know, and, you know, uh, hanging out with the whores and the, the thieves and the, you know, the petty common people. And, uh, or the Buddha leaving his palace and, you know, mingling with ordinary humanity, so to speak, uh, becomes an important part of the whole thing because uh, we now have the skill and the ability to enter into the dream world of others, not change their dream world, not manipulate them, not make them wrong for it, uh, but simply as a way to commune and connect with them. And uh, that's, uh, that's the ideal of the crazy wisdom master. But I should say, you know, should add to that, that, that the... Uh, Legitimate crazy wisdom masters are few and far between. Um, most are just more crazy than wise, <laughs> let's say. <clears throat> but the, she, uh, the she's true... the only woman on the list as well. Well, she, uh, you know, is a very interesting case because I don't, for a moment, see uh, Yeko Osaki. Nobody claims in the in the in the book either written about her that she, uh, you know, was some perfected being or anything like that. Uh, she died, as you know, uh, you know, 25 years of age just after having an awakening. What she had was a very powerful Satori, an initial awakening. And her own master said she would have needed another seven years to purify her character and to integrate the whole thing and so on and so forth. But she's still a, a, a tremendously uh, you know, inspiring and important figure anyway because she did all this on her deathbed. And uh, at that age too, um, which is very uncommon. And uh, the intensity of her effort. Uh, plus the connection she had with her, 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 uh, her Rashi, her Zen guru, uh, Harada, uh, was very moving. And uh, uh, so she's a great motivator to look at her life and say, you know, wow, she can do this. She's sick. She's in bed. She's on her deathbed. Uh, and she still has this burning passion for truth. And she has this radical awakening just before she dies. Yeah, it's, a, it's a wonderful story. Yeah, I mean, the others were all, you know, more, more, more or less household names. <clears throat> uh, you know, gurus, and most of them lived to an old age. Um, and so um, they're, we sort of take for granted, you know, the quality of their being and their realizations. But she was unusual in, uh, in, in, in her life, in her, the, the brevity of the whole trip, the shortness of it, the, uh, uh, and the tenacity that she showed in the face of great illness. Yeah. Well, Phil, we're just gonna we're gonna start wrapping it up. Thank you so much for sharing your your insights and your wisdom. I think it's been a, it's been a great interview. Do you want to tell people how uh, you know what's going on with you, how people can get in touch with you, and you know workshops well, you're doing? Well, I I, I, uh, I provide uh, private coaching sessions. Uh, I have a lot of clients around the world that I work with by Skype and uh, or by phone. Uh, these are one hour sessions in, w in which we examine. Uh, the uh, 
the issues of what's in the way of deeper awakening in life. And uh, I also do uh, workshops and um, uh, talks and signings in different parts of the different parts of the world. I was in England uh, a year and a half ago, a couple of lovely, lovely bookstores in London, one of which I was invited to, and I didn't know where I was going. I just, it was a, it was an address of a is building it, above a, Watkins, it, it was, was it? Uh, that was one, but this was another one. It was to Atlantis bookshop. And I, uh, I was invited to this place called the moot with no name. And it was a um, building above a pub. And I think I'm going into a, a room with a bunch of people who were waiting for me. There. And there was, uh, you know, t- for a talk and there was sure enough, there's a flip chart and the, my books were there, three dangerous magi. And uh, there's 40 people sitting in front of me, each of them with an ale in front of them. And I realized I was in a pub. The actual talk was in a pub. And it was one of the best audiences I ever had. <laughs> so uh, There you go. All of them, uh, you know, return from the marketplace with the, with the, with the ale. Yes. But that, yeah. So I, I uh, do provide uh, – uh, uh, I run workshops and um, and give talks. I'm going to be yeah. giving a talk and a book signing for Root Awakening at my own bookstore – in my own city here, Banyan Books, um, on October 18th, cool. Thursday night, 7 o'clock. How much do you charge for, for uh, one-on-one sessions? Uh, the one-on-one sessions are $100 an hour. That's $100 Canadian an hour, yeah. And a sliding scale I have for for those that are in financial hardship. Do you have a copy of The Rude Awakening there in front of you? No, it's on my Kindle. Okay, all right. Oh, you had a Kindle. Ah, you read it through Kindle, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm all, yeah, Kindle's great. Kindle's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bill, Good. thank you so much. Um, I will certainly put the links to your books on the description page for the YouTube uh, description page. So do leave us a comment for Phil or I on the discussion. Uh, hope you enjoyed this. This is Ken and Phil Masoboga. Thanks for watching. Bye. Take care, Ken. Bye-bye. Liara. And uh, as to what uh, is, uh, let's say, blocking us or impeding us from living that full capacity, this is something that uh, uh, mystics and religious thinkers and philosophers and psychologists have uh, tackled for a long time, all coming up with different views, but all basically agreeing that we're uh, not fully experiencing the anywhere near the the reality of, of what we're capable of experiencing. And uh, whether that is thought of as moving from a point A to a point B in terms of a progression, a development of wisdom, understanding, consciousness, or whether that is thought of as we already are that which we seek, but it's merely veiled or covered, uh, much like clouds covering the sun, which is already there. Um, however we think of that is secondary to the reality that uh, uh, there is a process of, of, of awakening that occurs as we look uh, deeper into our nature. The old expression, when you're in a burning building, never mind how the fire started, just get out of the building, uh, becomes important here. Because the, the analysis and the speculating and the conjecturing and the, th- the philosophizing, theorizing as to how the fire started is really uh, secondary to the practicality of moving out of it. And this is where the work really gets engaged, and this is what uh, uh, separates... Um, uh, let's say the, the you know the, the the theoretical philosopher from the uh, the mystic that is actually engaged in the process of uncovering their true nature. Now, one can be I often say one can be a philosopher and a mystic at the same time. There's no problem there. Or philosopher in the true meaning of the word, lover of uh, knowledge and wisdom. Uh, however, a lot of philosophies, especially modern academic philosophies, more hair-splitting uh, uh, details of theory. And uh, what we're really involved in, uh, in terms of engaging an awakening process, uh, is the practicality of it all. Um, how to get out of that burning building that we're in. Of course, what is the burning building? The burning building is the recognition uh, that we're uh, suffering uh, often unnecessarily. Uh, and that uh, we're not living anywhere near the uh, the capacity that, um, that we can be living. I just want to cover, uh, well, Rude Awakening's first hard truth is... The matter is much deeper and much more difficult and uh, it, because of having to engage all the 
fine print of everyday living and having to trying to integrate uh, these understandings and the and this and the and the you know the work with one's daily life. And so the main point that I was making there with that first point is that we have this regular self that we experience ourselves to be, and then this ideal that we aspire towards when we start thinking of spirituality. And uh, if we're not careful, what can easily happen is a, is a split occurs between the two, an artificial split occurs between the two, in which uh, the idealistic self um, uh, becomes more of a fantasy in our mind that we're not actually living. Mm. And so the way we try to try to live it is we uh, start preaching spiritual principles in a very casual way to people around us. Well, I, you know, I've read this. Uh, I practice this. I've studied that. Um, but so what? Is it making any difference, really? You know, and uh, is is the regular self been transformed in any sort of way? Is it even possible to transform the regular self? Uh, it, all these essential questions, you know, have to be looked at. And uh, I, I recall once uh, one fairly well-known spiritual teacher who traveled around the world doing a little research here and. Uh, uh, asking questions of spiritual teachers and people who had done transformational work and wanted to know the nitty-gritty details. Was anybody actually changing? And what he had discovered over time was that uh, when people were honest, when people really, you know, uh, confessed and admitted to to what sort of transformations had actually gone on in their life over a period of time, that there, were, there actually was very little change. Very few people were actually changing. Uh, people had gained information, knowledge, uh, you know, had read the books, had some experiences, and that's a whole other thing that, you know, we can talk about what, an ex what these experiences amount to, but that fundamentally there was no real essential change on the inside. And uh, so the problem, of course, with, you know, with spiritual experiences is that you have, a, what, you know, Maslow, for example, called peak experiences, uh, um, and then they become part of a trophy case, let's say, of experiences that we can talk about, boast about, uh, uh, compare, you know, to define our identity as different from others, uh, and so on and so forth. But again, uh, they're just ornaments. They're not really amounting to anything. Phil, no that it's hard. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, the you know that whole thing with that book was. Uh, I, I'm in my you know approaching my mid fifties now, and uh, I started on the spiritual path at a very young age, <clears throat> late teens, early twenties, seriously. And each decade presented certain th phases of uh, understanding and and uh, growth that I went through. And uh, reaching around the half century mark, I, be I became aware of the need to use uh, a little more critical thought in terms of applying it towards uh, the, uh, the the limitations of spirituality and um, uh, of the various approaches to spirituality, uh, of course, as well. And the first thing that became obvious to me was over the years of being involved, 30 years in various forms of uh, personal growth communities and various spiritual communities and awakening schools, that was that there's this very sharp distinction between uh, the conventional self and the ideal self that we aspire towards. Uh, and many of the early uh, humanistic psychologists became aware of this in the early 20th century. People like Maslow and Rogers and uh, Otto Rank and, and these guys were becoming aware that there was a, a, an issue of the split between the idealized self and the reality of simply what we are. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the humanistic psychotherapies that were developed by those people and that really came into their own sort of in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, altered the approach of psychotherapy from having to uh, uh, fix or change ourselves into some uh, idea of normalcy that we should be conforming to, uh, to a different approach which was recognizing what's going on for us right now in this moment, simply in this moment. Um, and can there be a deeper, more profound, radical acceptance of what is occurring for us in this moment instead of always struggling with what we are and trying to match it to some ideal of what we should be? And so the, that's why I wrote that first hard truth, that's the, you know, that the whole idea of awakening is, uh, uh, is much more difficult than people uh, uh, commonly think it is when they f pick up their first book on, uh, on, uh, you know, on transformational work. Um, because in the beginning, it does seem, you know, quite um, 
attractive in many ways, the idea that we simply have to study, understand, do this, do that, and there will be these uh, uh, extraordinary changes occurring within us. Um, but as anybody knows who tackles this issue, the... the Hello everybody, it's me, Kenneth, and I'm here with Phil, Phil Misselberger, uh, or P.T. Misselberger, and Phil is the author of three books, A Natural Awakening, or Natural Awakening, The Three Dangerous Magi, and his last book came out last year, which is uh, A Rude Awakening. And I will not uh, read out Phil's complete bio <laughs> because it's really long, and you know the number of paths that he, the path that's paths that he's explored uh, are really uh, numerous. Uh, but uh, suffice to say that he is a transpersonal therapist. He is a workshop leader, and he lives in Canada. So, Phil, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Ken. Glad to be here. So, Phil, um, you know, let's let's kind of stick with the theme of awakening this uh, this hour. And you know, I I feel like there were many. Well, it's two approaches that you're taking with your two books, Natural Awakening and Rude Awakening. And in Natural Awakening, you know, I guess there's a, there was a lot of clarity that you brought out in this process of, of, of awakening and enlightenment or seeking enlightenment or clarifying what enlightenment is. And in Rude Awakening, you, in a sense, uh, made sure to deal with a lot of common fallacies uh, that are out there today in this day and age about awakening and enlightenment so maybe let's just start with the very basics you know before going into it too deep um do you want to define awakening for us well um one of the um surest uh models that uh, i like to use for this is uh, was gurdjieff's um uh, way of putting it, uh, he had a very simple way of, de of describing uh, the idea of awakening, which is that um, uh, we're all in a type of prison, <clears throat> um, but we can't get out of the prison until we first realize we are in a prison. And so uh, the idea, of course, is that um, we humans are living only a tiny percentage of our potential capacity uh, for experiencing uh, reality and for experiencing uh, the nature of who we really fundamental change. Sorry, before you go on, I want to clarify this uh, term that you're using, the idealized self. Would you say that's the same thing as the higher self? Or what most people think a higher self is? No, in, in, uh, in the term that I mean it by, uh, the idealized self is a fantasy that um, uh, we aspire towards. And uh, is a part of a false part of personality. So it's a right. new so persona it's a that we, yeah, it's a fiction. It's a new persona that we develop. Uh, the higher self. Um, it's tricky in terms of terms, in terms of terminology, because uh, it, it, certainly many people who get involved with um, uh, awakening teachings uh, don't necessarily care that much for the term higher self, because it, it involves something that is. The idea of something that is above something else, which um, above what? I mean, what are we really talking about here? If uh, if we're seeing beyond the illusion of space and time, and separation and so forth, then uh, the higher doesn't uh, is not a particularly good term. But of course, it's a metaphor. Higher self is a metaphor for uh, a, a depth of wisdom and a greater clarity, uh, a deeper understanding of true nature, our true nature and what that is. So, uh, no, they're different. Your higher self, uh, if it means anything, if it, if it is a metaphor that refers to uh, our actual conditioned condition uh, via enlightenment and awakening, then that's fine. But idealized self, as I'm using it, is a fiction that we create in our mind and, and is, a, is, a, is a, a very common problem among spiritual seekers. Mm. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to, to talk about as well with that train of the train of thought was, I guess we see a lot of um, actually what I'm seeing in the course community is this um, adherence to I am not a body, you know, and I, you know, it's all an illusion, and I guess that also is a parallel with what some people call the neo advaita community, where 
you know, we have these teachers just coming out saying, like referring to themselves in the third person saying it's not real, so and so forth. But do you want to comment on that? Is that what you're saying here, an avoidance to uh, be the lower self or to yeah, abide it, in that ideal, idealized self? Exactly. The, um, the uh, problem with the idealized self uh, in a, from, a, from the spiritual point of view is that uh, inevitably it involves um, a, 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 some sort of a disassociation from physical reality and the body as well. 